is the Bible historically reliable? That's the question for tonight. Is the Bible historically reliable? Uh, this is a question that gets um, thrown around quite often, and I don't know why this microphone's being persnickety tonight, but it is. And uh, it's a question that gets thrown around quite often. A lot of times you'll find people that will say, uh, well, let me tell you what really happened. Let me tell you what really went on. The Bible is just a, a collection of stories that are written to, to kind of sugarcoat the reality of what really went on. And so, so is the Bible historically reliable? Now, before we answer that question, we have to ask ourselves, is that even a claim that the Bible makes of itself? Because here's the thing. Other religious texts exist. Other religions have their texts. Many of them don't claim to be historically reliable. So if the Bible doesn't claim to be historically reliable, this is a moot point. We don't even have to discuss this. But I would argue if the Bible claims to be historically reliable, and a good place to look for that is at the very beginning of Luke's Gospel. Now Luke is just writing Luke and Acts, but we can extrapolate from what Luke says to the entirety of the Bible. Luke, being a physician, being someone who is, is very methodical in his approach to things, tells us at the beginning of his, his gospel, and, and just a little side note before I read this, is a little point of trivia, Luke wrote more of the New Testament than any other person. We often think Paul did. Paul has more books attributed to him, but sheer number of words... Luke limits. Because Luke wrote Luke and Acts. So between those two books, that's more of the New Testament than any other person. So uh, this is what he says. That Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things that have been accomplished among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word have delivered them to us, it seemed good to me also, having followed all things closely, for some time past, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, that you may have certainty concerning the things you have been taught. So here's what Luke is saying. He says, these eyewitnesses, the people that have seen this, this has been written down. I want to give Theophilus, this person he's writing this for, I want to give him an orderly account of the things that happened so that you may have certainty about what you've been taught. So in other words, what Luke is saying is, I want to make sure, Theophilus, that you know that what you believe is true. In other words, historically reliable, historically accurate. Historical accuracy matters. Because if the Bible is not accurate in its history, how can we trust on anything else? If the Bible isn't true in every area, it's not true in any area. If there's an area of the Bible where we can say, well, that didn't happen, then we can't trust any other area. And here's the question I always like to ask people. Who gets to decide? You know, if, if, if there's things in the Bible that aren't true, you know, that's the case. Who gets to decide that? Do you get to decide? Do I get to decide? If so, why don't we even have this book? Let's just throw it out if, if we can't trust it. So is the Bible historically accurate? Now that is not as easy a question to answer as you might think. Historical accuracy is a very difficult question to answer fully. And there's reasons for that. There's difficulty uh, with historical analysis in general. And I'm giving you three reasons why it's difficult. There are others. But for the ancient world, here are three reasons why historical analysis is tough. Okay, first is the inherent weakness of archaeology. Now, when I was a kid, I loved the Indiana Jones movies, and so I used to think that's what archaeologists did. That they went on these quests, and they found stuff, and, and it was easy, relatively so, as long as the Nazis weren't after you. So that's what I thought archaeology was. That's not what archaeology You know what archaeology is? Digging in the dirt. Carefully. Carefully digging in the dirt. And you take a scoop of dirt and you put it in a sieve and you shake that sieve and you look at what's left. That's archaeology. And you do this 
repeatedly, over and over and over again. I applaud archaeologists because they have perhaps the most boring job in all historical study. And that's saying something for some of y'all because I know how much y'all think about history. I'm, I'm looking at you, Carol. <laughs> but the point is, is that here's what archaeology is. It's the study of what's left behind and what isn't destroyed. So think about this. How much stuff do you have from 10 years ago? Okay. How much stuff do you have from 50 years ago? Too much. Okay. If, if somebody 100 years from now were to dig up your house, could they figure out your life with 100% accuracy just based on what's left behind? It'd be kind of tough, right? I often wonder, you know, Lord willing, if, if, if the Lord doesn't come back and we're, you know, human beings are here for, you know, 50,000 more years, and they uncover the remnants of our civilization, what are they going to think? What are they going to think when they uncover the ruins of Walmart? <laughs> I mean, I just often wonder that. I mean, you know, are they going to think we were some kind of weird, you know, cult worshipers of, of this place? I mean, you know, what are they going to think? And that's the problem with archaeology. Archaeology is inherently limited because it's the study of what we leave behind. We don't leave everything behind. Some stuff is destroyed. Some stuff gets misplaced and scattered. And, you know, it's really the study of our garbage. And that's the problem, a challenge. Because only what's left gets found. You think we found everything that could be found? No, because we can't dig everywhere. You know, you go over to Israel today, there's places that archaeologists would love to dig, and they can't. They can't dig for a couple reasons. One, because there's other buildings there, you can't dig when there's already something there. Or there's political reasons, or religious reasons, or, or different other uh, issues in place to keep them from digging in those areas. So the fact that we don't have archaeological evidence for everything shouldn't surprise us. It would be amazing if we did, but we don't. We have a lot of things. We don't have everything. And archaeology is also subject to interpretation. You know, if you find something... How, how many of you have, have found something like an arrowhead or something digging in your, your yard to find an arrowhead? Now, you know, there, there's ways you can study about those arrowheads, right? How do you know anything about those arrowheads? You have to compare it with what? Other arrowheads that other people have found and things like that. What if there are no other arrowheads? What if that's the only one? What if there's an inscription on it that is a language that nobody speaks any longer? Makes it hard, right? So, so this is the challenge inherent in archaeology. So a lot of people will say, critics of Christianity, well, you don't have archaeological evidence for that. And I say, so? A lot of things don't have archaeological evidence for. It doesn't mean it didn't happen. Just we hadn't found it yet. We hadn't dug in the right spot yet. One day we might. Until then, we just have to keep digging. Just keep digging. Okay? Um, second reason historical analysis is difficult is the farther back you go, the less precise dating becomes. Now, one of the things that always cracked me up, okay, when I was a younger teenager, people were scared to death about the coming of the year 2000. They were just terrified. The world's going to end in 2000. You know how arbitrary our dating is? There is absolutely no reason why it's the year 2019 other than the fact that people say it's the year 2019. We even got a calendar wrong. Originally, the thought was is that Jesus was born in 1 B.C. We now think he was born sometime between 7 and 4 B.C. So we even got that wrong. Okay, so we, we are completely arbitrary in our day. The farther back you go, the less precise things become. Okay? And, and there's, a, there's a whole study of this, and I think it's fascinating, where people study the dates of things. You, know, you have different calendars, you have different ways of reckoning things. So it gets very, you know, we can talk about things that happen in very precise dates and years because we're recent to the events. 
But you go back a thousand years, go back two thousand years, three thousand years, those dates become less and less precise. So the farther back you go, the less precise you become. That makes historical analysis difficult. Because here's what some critics of Christianity will say. I'll use an example. Um, in the Christmas story in Luke, Luke says that Caesar Augustus ordered a registration of the world and that this was done while Serenius or Quirinius was governor of Syria. Critics will say, well, if you look at when he was governor, that couldn't coincide. Well, it depends on where you put your date. The dates are kind of flexible. Or the date of the Exodus. There's actually two common theories of when the Exodus happened, and they're about 250 years apart. And it makes all the difference in the world which one you pick, based on what the archaeological evidence says, because dating becomes less and less precise at the farther back you go. And then thirdly, different periods of history value different elements of historical study. <coughs> what we focus on, what we think about, is really not what ancient writers focus on. They do history different than we do history. And that makes a difference when how we read these historical things. We can't apply to the Gospels the same rules of history that we would apply to a biography of, say, George Washington. Okay, it's, it, they're written for different purposes at different times and different reasons. So we have to understand all of that, and that makes this somewhat challenging. Okay? So how do you determine, biblically speaking, if something is historically valid or reliable? You make a claim about the historicity of something, how do you know that that thing is true? Well, here's some rules, and I've kind of condensed, you can find people talking about different ways of doing this, I've kind of condensed it down into four that I think are the most critical. First, is it reasonable? Now, is it reasonable to make that claim? In other words, is there any other, is there a better alternative to that claim? Okay. So, you know, if, if, I, if I make a claim about, um, you know, the Wright brothers and, and the first airplane, I'm using something more recent in history. So, you know, if I say Wilbur and Orville Wright airplane flew because they flapped their arms really hard. Now, I can make that claim. Is that a reasonable claim to make? No, it's not. Why? There's a better, more reasonable alternative to that. So when you look at the Bible, and you look at the things going on in Scripture, ask yourself this question. Is there a better alternative than what the Bible presents? Most of the time, you're going to say there's not. Okay? Because, because the Bible holds up to that standard of being reasonable. And I think we can argue over the details of that, but that's a good beginning point to, uh, to stay. Secondly, what evidence exists that would make one not accept the claim being put forth? Here's what that means. Is there evidence that contradicts openly contradicts the claim being put forth? Is there something that would be so blatantly obvious as to discredit it? So going back to, say, George Washington, if I said, you know, that George Washington was really made out of wood, that, that's, a, that's an unreasonable thing, but there's evidence to show that that's not true, that my claim is completely false in that sense. How does this apply to the Bible? Well, we have to ask ourselves what evidence would refute the claims of Scripture. And I'll use the Gospels as an example for this. In the Gospels, and people really smarter than anybody I know um, have done this, uh, have looked and compared the Gospels, the four Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, to other ancient documents of the same era. And have asked themselves, because one claim about the Gospels is that they're just made up. They were written later by people you know, far after the time. They'll ask questions like, do they use the right distribution of names? And what I mean by that is, you know, when we moved to this area, we learned that there were certain names that were more common in this area than in other parts of where we were from. Okay? Particularly the last names. So if I'm writing a story about Denmark, South Carolina, 
I'm going to want to make sure I get a representation of the proper names that are used. And I don't get that mixed up. Well, they've studied this in the Gospels. <clears throat> Nail that right on the head. Mary, John, James, these are all common names, and they show up in about the same percentage as they would have in the general population at the time. If you're writing a story about something that took place 200 years ago, you would want to know what the most common names were 200 years ago, and it's not the same name that we have today. Okay, So, so that, that's an important thing. Same with geography. If you're writing about somewhere that you've never been, you're not going to know the geography of that place, right? So you're going to want to make sure you know the terrain, the locations. I mean, if I write a story about Denmark, South Carolina, I've never been to Denmark, I'm not going to talk about the majestic snow-capped mountains. Okay, that's just not going to be part of the story. The Gospels get the geography right. And they talk about things that you have to be there and know the geography to know that. So this is the kind of evidence that supports it. So there's no evidence outside of that to discredit that claim. Okay. Third, is it verified by independent sources? Is it verified by independent sources? Are there other people um, that would support what's being said? Other documents, other sources? Um, what's the outcome of these claims? Is there historical evidence that you can point to to say, this makes sense because this happened? Just like Mark Twain, when asked about the circumstances of his birth, said, I don't remember the event, but I have known its effects my entire life. <laughs> um, that's kind of the point, is that you, know, you may not be able to say, I know for certain this happened because I was there, but you can say, I see the event, the, the effects of that event, I can work backwards to say this is what actually happened. It's an important gift to be able to do that. Okay, so is it verified? And then, fourthly, is there a motive for falsifying a claim? You can get everything else right, but you can still make up a lie. So what's the motive for lying? And I think with the Bible, there's no motive for lying. Particularly with the Gospels, uh, there's no reason that they would have made this up. No good reason for them to have made this up. Um, and then another way to think about it, are there elements of the story? This is, this is helpful. Uh, are there elements of the story that would be considered negative aspects to the story and therefore not something that somebody would make up? Let me give an example of this. How many times have you told a story and you were really the bad guy in that story, but the way you told that story, you came out the hero? <laughs> Why? It's what we do, right? We tend to cover up our mistakes. We tend to, to, to gloss over the negative things. When it comes to the Gospels particularly, and the reason I'm focusing on the Gospels, we'll see in just a second, but when it comes to the Gospels particularly, you know, we don't, the Gospels are, are basically anonymous, but tradition tells us that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John wrote it. One of my favorite events in the Gospel of Mark is what I call the Alfred Hitchcock moment in Mark's Gospel. Okay? You know, Alfred Hitchcock always made a cameo in his movies. And he always showed up in some kind of obscure uh, fashion. I think Mark makes one of those moments in his, uh, in his Gospel in Mark chapter 14. This is when Jesus is arrested in Mark chapter 51 and 52. The only gospel to mention this, and I truly believe this is Mark kind of saying, see, I didn't come out so pretty in all this. And a young man followed him with nothing but a linen cloth about his body, and they seized him. But he left the linen cloth and ran away naked. Okay? Now, there's no good reason for that to be in the story, because it doesn't it doesn't add to the story, it doesn't do anything. So I think Mark's just put that in there and be like, listen, I was this young guy, I was there, and I ran away naked. It's the Alfred, Alfred Hitchcock moment of Mark's gospel. Or for more recent, it's the Stan Lee moment um, of the Marvel movie. Okay? So the point being is that sometimes there's things in the gospels that why would you make that up? I mean, it doesn't make you look good. It doesn't, it doesn't make anybody 
you know, come out smelling like roses so that you, you don't make this stuff up. So, to me, all of that to be said to get to this point. The definitive question of historical reliability in the Gospels, in the Bible, the one thing that if it happened, everything else falls into place. If this one event didn't happen, nothing else matters. And that's the resurrection of Jesus. <coughs> Did the resurrection happen as reported in Scripture? That's the question. Because if that's wrong, why are we here? Okay, it doesn't matter if everything else happened. If that one thing didn't happen, it's pointless. So this is the definitive question. So I want us to spend the rest of our time tonight looking at how do we know the resurrection happened. This is a bold claim. I mean, it's the boldest claim in the Bible that Jesus is alive. But it's the central claim of the Bible. So what does the, the New Testament actually say? Well, this is basically what the New Testament says. That Jesus died by crucifixion under the hands of the Romans. So he died by crucifixion. The Romans did it. That Jesus was buried in a tomb by Joseph of Arimathea. That on the first day of the week, the tomb was found empty by women. That Jesus appeared to his followers following this event, and that his followers believed he had been resurrected. And there's a lot of details that go into that, but this is the <coughs> consensus that the Gospels present. Okay, that this is what happened. That Jesus died, he was buried, and he rose again. In fact, this is the earliest, um, one of the earliest statements of faith in the Bible. 1 Corinthians 15, um, Paul's writing probably as early as 50 AD, so 20 years roughly after the events. He says, what I received I pass on to you as a first importance. That Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried and rose again according to the Scriptures. That well phrase there seems like that may be something that actually predates Paul. And some scholars believe that was the earliest creed in the Christian church from as early as maybe 35, 36 AD. So this is the central claim of Christianity, that Jesus lives. He died and then he lives. So, two common objections that get thrown around from time to time. And I want us to look at them. And I want us to look at the evidence well, I believe in historical reality that the resurrection happened. Okay? The first objection that people throw around is that Jesus did not actually die by crucifixion. Now, this will come in the form of two, two typical challenges. Okay? The first is that what's sometimes called the swoon theory, that, that he just appeared dead, that he was basically comatose, that the Romans botched the crucifixion and that he really didn't die. Okay. That's one proposal that people put out to discredit the resurrection. They argued that he was taken from the cross, he was put in the tomb, and that over the course of a couple days in the cool, moist environment of the stone tomb, it revived him, he got up, he went out, and people thought he was alive because they had thought he was dead, but he really wasn't dead. Okay. That's one way people talk about this now. There's a problem with that, and that is the Romans were expert crucifiers. Okay. Absolutely expert crucifiers. I mean, they knew how to do it and do it efficiently. And so the, the idea that the Romans botched the crucifixion is really just absurd. Okay. So that's one thing. Another thing, and this is actually what Muslims believe, is that Jesus did not die on the cross because somebody swapped him. He was swapped out for somebody else. That somebody actually died, but it wasn't Jesus. Just somebody that looked like Jesus. And that's why when people saw Jesus after the fact, they thought he was resurrected, but he was just hiding out in town until you know, the, the trouble died down. And then he showed up like, hey, they didn't, they didn't kill him. Okay. So I think both of those don't hold any weight because if that was the case, all somebody would have to do is say, let's kill him again. <laughs> you know, it would make sense. So, um, and, and the Romans would have pointed out the mistake very quickly. They would have said, you know, he didn't die. They, they, would, have, they would have quickly tried to fix their mistake. Um, and so I don't think that argument holds a lot of weight. And it's really not that common of an argument any longer, but occasionally you'll find people mm -hmm. that will say, well, Jesus didn't die. Okay. 
or that he, you know, sometimes you'll hear some people say, well, he, he, after, the reason he was gone was he left and he went out to Asia or somewhere else, and that's where he lived out the rest of his days and, and then died old age or something. So the second objection, the more common objection, is that the disciples made it up. Like the disciples just made it up. You know, people don't come back from the dead. They just lied about it. It was in their best interest politically and economically to make it up because they wanted power. And this was all created late, later by people when they could obtain positions of influence. And so people will say, well, the disciples did the body. That's what the Jewish leaders paid the guards off to say happened. The disciples came in the middle of the night, took the body, and hid it. Plus, Let's, let's just think about this logically. Let's go back to that question. Is it reasonable? Is that a reasonable explanation that they hid the body? Well, no. For two reasons. One, if the body was hidden, somebody could have found it. And that would have really put a wrench in the Christian's claim. The other reason is because tradition and history tell us that each of the disciples, except for John, died a gruesome martyr's death. Now, people will die for a lie, and they do it all the time. But they very, very, very rarely will die for a lie if they know it's a lie. If somebody is trying to kill you, and you have the body of Jesus hidden somewhere, all you got to do is show them the body and you live, what are you going to do? You're going to spill the beans. Chuck Colson, I don't know if, if you're familiar with Chuck Colson or not, he was a um, was one of Nixon's uh, fix-it people. He was White House counsel, brilliant man, ended up in jail because of Watergate, and uh, became a Christian while he was in jail. And he argued that this was the most compelling reason for him that Christianity was true. He said because in Watergate, there were a few dozen people that knew the secret, and every one of them spilled the beans. At the first sign of legal trouble, they just started blabbing to whoever they could talk to. And here you have the disciples going to their death because Jesus lived. So to me, that, that's a very compelling reason to me. People don't die for a lie if they know it's a lie. Okay? So that's one argument the disciples did lie. Now, another thing that people say when the disciples made up is that Jesus wasn't actually buried. The Romans didn't typically bury people. Uh, crucifixion was intended to be a means of humiliation. So typically, typically, when people were crucified, they were left on the cross as a public display of Roman authority. And, you know, don't mess with Rome. This is what happens to people who mess with Rome. So some scholars will say, well, you know, Jesus wasn't actually buried, that he just was allowed to stand on the cross and his body decomposed naturally. Well, there's a problem with that. And I hope you see the problem with that. Is if Jesus was still on the cross, all somebody had to do was when somebody said, Jesus is alive, go and say, well, who's that? So that doesn't hold water, but there are some people who argue that's what happened. And I think it's important to remember that Joseph of Arimathea was an important person. He had pull to be able to get the body from the Romans. Okay? Um, some people say the women went to the wrong tomb because they were early in the morning, it was dark, and they didn't have a good sense of direction, so they went to the wrong tomb. Well, when the sun came up, somebody could have been like, it's over there, 